Good, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dr. James Lin. Uh, I'm the president of LeCom Institute of Successful Aging, and I am the uh, program director for the Northwestern Pennsylvania Regional Response Health Collaborative Partnership with Department of Health and um, uh, DHS. I'm sorry about that, sorry about uh, that. interruption. So as uh, some of you are starting to enter, uh, you can mute your uh, microphone, and then uh, if you have any questions, uh, we can use the chat feature to um, answer any questions. Um, so today, uh, with the webinar, this is recorded, so if any of your administrators or your executives cannot make it to webinar, we will make this available so that they can review it if uh, need be. Um, but basically today, what we have uh, for uh, the webinar is that we want to give a brief introduction uh, to all of you as to what uh, we do and who we are, because some of you may not know what we do and who we are, and also the leadership team that's running uh, the RACP for Northwestern Pennsylvania. We also have our educational partner, uh, uh, the Jewish Healthcare Foundation uh, down in Pittsburgh, and all the RACPs for the state are going to be participating in this educational program. So I'm going to give a few minutes uh, to um, Nancy to d discuss and describe her role and her um, uh, partnership. So, um, I'm unmuted. I could take it from here. Okay. Great. Thank you, everyone, and I appreciate the time on the schedule, Dr. Lynn. I'm Nancy Zions. I'm the Chief Operating Officer and Chief Program Officer of the Jewish Healthcare Foundation in Pittsburgh. And some of you may know our work in aging, which goes back almost 30 years. We are uh, very involved. We run Dementia Friends for all of the Commonwealth. We ran the Raven Initiative together with UPMC to help reduce readmissions from skilled nursing facilities back into hospitals. We help to stand up community health choices uh, across all five of the regions in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And we also run PA Pulse and the Coalition for Quality at End of Life. So this is an area of focus for us. It's an area of passion for us. We are deeply committed to helping the front line in long-term care be successful. We know that uh, none of you started off 2020 thinking that this was the way the year was gonna go. And we know that your jobs have become much more difficult and much more stressful over the past few months. And at the request of the state starting in April, Jewish Healthcare Foundation provided ongoing webinars and web-based support to make sure the personal care assisted living facilities had some access to information and resources to help them deal with the pandemic. For this second phase or this uh, regional uh, health response, uh, where the state is divided up into regions, and you'll learn more about this, we are also participating with all of the regions in the state to make sure that personal care assisted living facilities and skilled nursing facilities have access to relevant and targeted education and training, as well as a web-based portal where they can um, gain access to resources and communicate. And my colleague, Stacey Bonnenberger, will describe that in a minute. But the reason I wanted to be on this webinar today was to let you know that you are going to be receiving some emails next week that will mention the work of the Learning Network, will mention tomorrow's healthcare, and you will start to receive invitations the following week, the week of the 10th, for webinars for personal care assisted living facilities and skilled nursing facilities separately. We didn't want you to not open those webinars. We didn't want you to not click on those links. We wanted you to know that that's a really important part of this program. The education and learning part of this program is here to support you. So your input, your questions in the chat as we go forward over the course of the next month will help us to understand what are the pain points you're feeling in the field and how we can be better able to help bring you resources to solve those in partnership with the other partners like LECOM that you're gonna hear from today. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Stacy Bonnenberger to explain our web-based portal, Tomorrow's Healthcare, and I appreciate this time. Thanks. Stacy. it's to you. All right, thank you, Nancy, and uh, thank you, Dr. Lynn, for inviting us here today and giving us this opportunity. So welcome to, let's see if I can control, um, um, maybe I need to do it this way, does that work? Okay, 
for some reason, it's not letting me advance the slides. So if you could, I have control of your screen, but it won't let me advance. So that, thank you. So welcome to tomorrow's healthcare. We are a web-based platform, meaning you will go onto your computer and onto the internet to access us. We um, are here to really do a few things. One is to foster, you know, action among professionals. This is a platform where you'll actually be communicate with each other, um, potentially posing a question or sharing a best practice when um, another provider or community would benefit from it. Uh, we also will be able to provide you with areas where you can learn and communicate and collaborate with each other. Next slide, please. So what will happen, uh, most likely Monday at some point, you will receive an email to introduce and invite you to log in. You will simply log in using your email as well as the password welcome. And once you um, do that, next slide please. It will take you to this screen where it will prompt you to automatically enter your own password or a new password. Once you complete this form, you can click submit and you will be ready to roll. Next slide, please. So in the interest of, you know, what happens if I have a change, you are always going to be able to change your profile and adjust it and however you want. You can add a photograph. You can also provide, you know, any other information you want. We also have the ability for you to contact us. We will have a specific email as well as a form you can fill out on Tomorrow's Healthcare. Um, next slide, please. Now, for some of you that were part of the eSkip program, some of this may be familiar. We utilize Tomorrow's Healthcare as a platform then as well. Uh, we have, I do want to let you know, gone through and really scrubbed all of our resources we um, have the ability to update at any given time. So we wanted to make sure we had the most current and valuable resources for you. So um, to walk you through some of this, this is an example of what the personal care assisted living will look like. The skilled nursing facility will be exactly the same, except it would say skilled nursing facility on top. Um, I just saw someone ask in the chat that if you are responsible for more than one facility, um, it shouldn't be a problem if you need to have access to both the Smith, um, we call them communities, the Smith, the skilled nursing facility community, as well as the personal care assisted living. That is not a problem. You would just need to let us know. And Stacy, if I can interrupt you as well, if you have somebody else uh, in your facility that you would like to provide access to the community for, you would just need to let us know and send us their name and email as well. And we would be happy to add them. Yeah, there will be more information coming out about that. We're going to have a dedicated email that you'll be able to email. You know, I need um, people can just email and ask for logins for uh, the communities. So we're now going to walk through just a very brief tour of what you'll have. This is your home page. You would be able to click on any of the four icons you see there. Next slide. The forum is a place really where we will provide you with announcements, so things that are very important and pertinent that you learn right away, as well as additional education uh, webinars or um, content that we found that we feel that we want to bring it to your attention. The area for general questions is really meant to be your area, to pose the questions like I mentioned, or to comment on a best practice. Next slide, please. Now, just to let you all know, when you are first um, put into the community, you will be automatically subscribed to all announcements and forum um, responses. There is a very easy way, if it becomes too much for you, you can unsubscribe to the list and you will no longer get those automatic updates. We do kind of want to you know, let you know that you would then not know if something, there was an announcement or there was a discussion going on. So you would have to go on to check on your own. So it's really up to, your, up to you and how you want to go with that. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's get to know your space. We do have a resource section. 
Again, um, if you were on the eSkip program, we have something very similar. We have recategorized to make them more pertinent for today as we've learned a lot more about COVID since April. So you can see there are seven different categories. Next slide, please. And what you'll see is that each of these categories then open up to further categories. So for example, as you're preparing for COVID, you could click on that and you would find a file that has information on infection prevention, information on communication. So how are you communicating within and outside of your organization? And then lastly, workforce um, concerns and resources that would be handy. Next slide, please. Just to let you know, we um, scour resources, and these are just a few of the websites that we are regularly on, in addition to many more. Uh, we will also be putting resources that are given to us by the state or by the RISC program, by the um, health systems that is pertinent for you as well. Next slide, please. The events, this will be a place where you can find all of the upcoming web webinars that Nancy mentioned. Um, we are working on the last logistics about um, our registration process for you, but that will all be worked out in time for your first webinar to attend. Next slide, please. And lastly, learning sessions is, is the area where any webinar that is provided by Jewish Healthcare Foundation for the program will then be recorded and placed there with all of the materials that you would need. And that is an area where you can access it at a later date if you weren't able to attend a webinar or if you have other staff within your organizations and community that you would want them to um, take time to watch a webinar as well. Next slide. And then lastly, again, we are here to help you. Uh, you can always press the help button and fill the form. And like I mentioned, there will be a specific email that we will share with you um, once we get that up and running. Next slide, please. Okay, I will turn it back to you, Dr. Lynn, and thank you so much for having us today. We really do appreciate being part of this amazing work that we're all embarking on. Thank you very much, Nancy and Stacy. Uh, we uh, are very much looking forward to all the resources that you can provide to all of us for education. So um, the next part of the agenda is I'm going to move into just some introduction to our um, uh, health system, as well as, the, first of all, the purpose of why we're all here uh, today. So the LECOM uh, uh, RACP will provide facility consultations that include clinical, educational, operational, and administrative support uh, in this fight in the pandemic that all of us are in. And uh, the overall goal from the state for this uh, RACP program uh, is uh, to promote health and stabilize the economy of region by directly supporting COVID-19 readiness and response in facilities. And we obviously want to improve the quality of care related to infection prevention and other priority healthcare conditions common to facilities. And we also, uh, when there is a pandemic like this, uh, we want to coordinate resources and uh, let the state Department of Health and DHS know what's going on on the ground level so that they can help us gather resources statewide and if need be, you know, this is a federal resource. Uh, this money comes from the CARES Act that was appropriated to uh, Pennsylvania, and then we put through re legislation uh, to actually have this money distributed to the six regions. Um, we want to uh, expand COVID-19 testing to include asymptomatic staff and patients and facility to expand public health uh, surveillances. Um, and we also want to help in implement best practices in infection control uh, uh, including but not limited to testing capabilities, infection control consultations, implementation, uh, contact tracing. Uh, we want to also have the opportunity to go in and, and provide advanced clinical care, uh, including on-site or telemedicine support uh, in clinical care, and we can remote monitor uh, uh, patients as well as physician consultations need be with our health system resources. And um, our health system also can provide alter alternate uh, care capacity for long-term care patients that with uh, COVID-19 uh, infection. So a little bit, next slide, please. A little bit about our uh, health system. So uh, LECOM Institute for Successful Aging is part of LECOM Health, and we're the arm that delivers uh, geriatric continuum of care for our health system. 
Um, so just to take a step back, LECOM Health has several components to it. We have uh, an educational arm, a healthcare delivery arm, and a research arm. And our health, uh, um, our education arm obviously includes a, uh, the largest medical school in the country. We have uh, four campuses now, uh, uh, two in Pennsylvania, one in Florida, and one in Elmira, New York. And we also have a school of pharmacy, uh, uh, college of dentistry, and um, we have several masters in healthcare related uh, uh, degree programs. Um, so uh, our educational arm is, is uh, our, uh, very robust with a lot of resources. Um, and our healthcare delivery arm includes uh, two, uh, three acute care hospitals, uh, Mill Creek Community Hospital, Corey Memorial Hospital, as well as Warren General. Um, and we have, uh, and within that, our strategic focus for our health system in the delivery site is really geriatric medicine as well as behavioral health. So I'm in charge of the uh, LECOM Institute of Successful Aging, which uh, over the last 11 years, uh, we have developed a vertically integrated continuum of care that includes a multi-specialty outpatient geriatric focused uh, specialty group. Um, we have a community arm that delivers uh, vaccinations. That's the Center for Health and Aging. We have a uh, adult daycare center. We have alternative uh, share housing model care. We have a uh, home health and hospice. That's uh, visiting nurses association, and we operate um, our uh, skilled nursing facility beds as well as uh, personal care, assisted living, and um, independent living uh, care models. Um, and so. Next slide, please. So we, we do have um, a lot of resources and we, we uh, over the last 11 years have developed a very geriatric focused uh, service line. Therefore, um, we have a lot of depth in terms of uh, any need that a geriatric patient would need at any time. And with that being said, you know, with this pandemic, um, pretty much in the early on, there was really no uh, direction and all of us that are on this boat, we sort of had to uh, do a lot of work on our own. And um, I'm glad that uh, we have this uh, regional collaborative and now finally we can have a coordinated effort uh, for education and for prevention and all the resources that we can get. So uh, this is just a summary slide of what we have done in our own health system and um, early on throughout this pandemic. And with this work, is because of this work, uh, I have a small talented team of people that were very dedicated to making this happen. And we were able to really uh, put together a program that is really uh, very suitable for this RACP program, which is why we were funded for it. But just a brief overview, you know, a lot of you already uh, did this on your own as well, I'm sure. Uh, but this is, you know, moving forward the next few months, you know, this is an opportunity for us to all collaborate to share best practices and so forth. And what we have done is that, um, you know, we stood up a command center on March 3rd uh, to uh, enact our emergency operational plan, which many of you have done as well. Um, and March 10th, we were one of the first facilities in our region to kind of stop visitations before uh, CMS and the federal government told us that we couldn't have visitors. Um, and we began uh, uh, building a COVID ready unit with uh, negative pressure rooms that we retrofitted uh, back in uh, March 16th. And on April 6th, within two or three weeks, we were able to fully operate that COVID-19 um, uh, unit. And we were one of the first uh, skilled nursing facilities in our region to take a, a positive COVID-19 patient in one of our skilled nursing facilities. Um, and throughout this pandemic, since we're a smaller uh, delivery system in our health uh, uh, system, in, in sort of our, in terms of our scope and size, in terms of a health system, um, we really had a difficulty, uh, difficult time procuring our own uh, 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 PPE uh, equipment uh, supplies uh, because, it, as all of you know, it was on allocation and stuff. So we really had to go uh, out of the box to really um, seek out direct manufacturing, both domestically and internationally, to procure uh, volumes of PPE. So throughout this pandemic, within our own health system, uh, we've never been short uh, PPE because of uh, uh, this opportunity that we had. So and I, I'm happy to offer that uh, this is the, the case uh, for our program in our seven counties. Um, uh, we are prepared to help you with PPE uh, because our supply chain is robust and strong, and we can uh, uh, hopefully 
uh, none of you would ever have to run out of PPE to protect your patient and your staff. Um, and then uh, we have worked really hard um, to uh, talk to vendors about rapid testing machines for skilled nursing facilities for our um, uh, region. And it's not only skilled nursing facilities, but personal care assisted living and, and uh, all of us that are in this region for what the RACP is going to be doing. So there's going to be more information to come about our testing, and I'm going to go over that. So next slide, please. So I'm just going to give an overview of the purpose of why we're here and what we're here to do for all of you. And there's uh, several categories, and I broke it down into categories. The first thing for communication, um, we have a 24-hour, uh, seven days a week call center, and many of you have uh, already called, and it's an answering service that would distribute and uh, triage for us uh, what the situation is. And we usually try to get back to you within hours and we do it as quickly as possible. And we have 24 hour uh, staff, our leadership is on call 24 hours. So that's the number that you see on the screen is 814-451-1595. And then um, this uh, email, info at lecomrrhc.org is our uh, general uh, email that uh, all the leadership on this uh, program will get when you email that. So if you have any questions or any concerns or anything that uh, you're not getting to, you, you for some reason have trouble with a call center, this is another way that you can email us and is monitored 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So we're currently building a website specifically uh, for the RACP, uh, for us, for the seven counties, for all of you uh, to use. So we're going to be posting, um, you know, uh, uh, documents, uh, best practices, most commonly asked questions, uh, all on there. And more importantly, we're building out a, a sort of a uh, 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 shopping cart for PPE. So you can actually uh, order PPE through the website, and that's what we're doing. So that if you have a shortage um, and, you know, you can just go on the website, order the quantities, and we'll be arranging um, the the delivery, you know, with our um, a warehouse that's ready here in Erie. And then I uh, just want to say, um, if you think you have an outbreak or you have a positive case, obviously um, you should let us know so we can help you. And then also you should report to DOH because there is a, a mechanism that as soon as they're um, notified, we, they, uh, there are several systems that they use to communicate, to assign missions to us so that we can track the missions and we can uh, communicate uh, with DHS and DOH. And just all of you know, uh, each of the RACPs are on the call twice a day, every day, um, with DOH and DHS just to sort of go over um, these type of missions. So if you need help and you have an outbreak, it's very important that um, you can let them know or let us know, and then we can put it into the system so we can track your facilities to see what your needs are, and we can, you know, complete the mission, so to speak, at, using their system. Next slide, please. So, this slide goes over our organizational chart. Um, these are the leadership, this is my leadership team that are running this RACP program. We obviously have a lot more people on the team, uh, but these are the key individual. So as you call that number, um, depending on what you need, they will direct us to who's gonna come contact you uh, in terms of your needs and stuff. So this is just a page that you can take a screenshot and then uh, you could just keep it. And I believe that Department of Health and DHS has this and has distributed this list as well. Next slide, please. So for testing, one of our uh, mission, obviously, is to help all of you in testing. As all of you know, it's been very, very difficult uh, uh, in getting testing supplies. And we will be assisting in helping you uh, procuring the supplies and the process for testing. And we will be asking, and, and Dr. Uh, Jamie Babiak is our Director of Operations. She'll be going over some of the initial assessment process with you in a little bit in this presentation, but, and I'll leave that for her to tell you. But in, in essence, our job is to help you procure testing supplies and help you manage and coordinate uh, your testing in-house, in uh, you know, in your facility if needed, and then also to help you complete uh, universal testing for all the uh, PCH and assisted living facilities. And I know all the SNFs have completed their universal testing, so now uh, uh, we're beginning to see some um, sort of um, uh, uh, positive cases popping up after our uh, universal testing, so that we're here to support that. Next slide, please. So in, in regards to PPE, like I mentioned before, 
um, we're going to be asking your current PPE supplies, your your usage, and then there's going to be a bunch of questions about burn rate. And Dr. Baby is going to go over that, so I'm not going to hit on that. But suffice to say, if uh, uh, before our website is up, if you need any requests for PPE, please email us or call us with that 24-hour number, and we'll get back to you. Next slide, please. So staffing. We'll also be helping you in facilitating mitigating staffing shortages. Uh, we all know that uh, uh, before the pandemic, we most of us have staff short, staffing shortages to begin with. And now uh, with the pandemic, and if you tested positive with your staff, there are going to be a, 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 a very uh, downchain effect of uh, shortages and stuff. So our job, part of our job as RACP is to help you facilitate and mitigate staffing shortages and help you cover the shortages if, if uh, there needs to be covered. And Dr. Babiak is going to go over that as well. Next slide, please. And uh, finally, we're going to be helping you uh, cohorting um, your patients. If you happen to have a positive patient in your facility and uh, your facility layout is not conducive to having the red, yellow, and green zone, and um, when we look at your uh, plans, we're going to be asking you for your facility uh, map, and then we're going to try to uh, discuss with you and, and uh, if you need our help in terms of help you figure out red, green, and yellow zones, uh, we'll be happy to do that. And if it's not conducive to your positive patients, um, we um, have uh, facilities ready for, to uh, help you coordinate alternative placement for them so that we can get your, uh, in the event of an outbreak, we can get your facility under control and so forth. Next slide, please. So uh, with that being said, um, if you, I'm going to turn this presentation over to Dr. Jamie Baby. She's going to go over what the on-site visit is all about as well as what our rapid response visit uh, uh, is going to be all about. And then um, uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions after she's done with the presentation. So, Dr. Babiak. Good afternoon. As Dr. Lin said, my main uh, goal in our team is to oversee the on-site visits and everything that goes along with them, so based on the needs that you have in your facilities. So, as you can see on the slide here, there's going to be two different types of visits. The first type is the on-site visits. There'll be an initial one. Uh, hope to be scheduled at your facilities if we have not talked to you or actually visited already um, by the end of August. And then the second visit will occur this fall. The first visit we'll go over a little bit more in detail um, in the next few slides, but the second visit will really be the, a similar type style as the first visit with some follow-up and any recommendations that we've discovered on the first visit. The rapid response visit will occur as needed and we'll have teams set up for those. This will be in the case of an outbreak at your facility in which the Department of Health would be notified and would send our team out to assist. This slide is gonna describe the pre-visit preparation. Now we have reached out and talked to actually most of our skilled nursing facilities as well as personal care and assisted living. Um, some of them have actually already received visits, so you can probably give any feedback at the end if you'd like to. Um, but I'll just take a few minutes to explain a little bit more in detail what you can expect for your facility visit. So for the pre-visit, our teams will be giving your facility a call, and we would likely want to connect with your nursing home administrator, director of nursing, or depending on your structure, maybe somebody from a regional office or corporate, depending on how those types of decisions are made. We, over the phone, will ask you some baseline questions. These are just going to be about key personnel, some facility information and layout information, number of staff and residents, any information about positive cases that have occurred, and then any staffing or PPE concerns. We'll coordinate the date and time of your on-site visit, and our team will send a confirmation email to whomever's email is provided on the call to confirm the date and time of the visit, and they will also send the assessment form to the facility. This is so that you can review it ahead of time and have any questions ready for us or any information prepared so that we can um, move through the visit efficiently. During the on-site visit, one of the first things that would actually be very helpful for our teams is to take a tour of your facility. This will help us in answering the questions that are completed in the assessment with your administrative team. During the tour, we want to see mainly the layout of the facility as well as make some observations as far as staff donning and doffing PPE, hand washing, and cleaning practices. 
this is something that if we don't happen to see it on the tour, we may ask to see it uh, just so that we have a good understanding that your staff have an understanding of what they're performing. This on-site visit can be completed with at least probably the nursing home administrator and or director of nursing, as well as if you have a corporate structure that would want to be present as well. During the on-site visit, after the tour, there's going to be a completion of a facility assessment. It's rather lengthy, but the main areas that it covers are listed here, and a lot of them are just elaborated on more than in the pre-assessment visit that we would perform over the phone. Staff numbers and resident census as well as census per hallway and different things like that will be collected. So that way if cohorting uh, needs are, are needed by your facility, we're able to assist with that. Your COVID-19 burden, so any present cases or any past cases that you've had in the facility between staff and residents. Screening procedures for staff, residents, and essential visitors. The cohorting plans that you have, whether you've had to use them or not, and your capabilities within your facility layout. PPE assessment and needs, and like Dr. Lynn said, whenever these items are discussed during this facility visit, it will ask this in detail. So you'll describe to us who wears a gown and when in the facility, for example. So if the gown is worn by staff in a yellow zone, a red zone, essential visitors, those types of things we would collect so that when we get a call that says you need gowns, we know who uses them and how often you use them. So if this is an item of need, we would need to know your burn rate to go along with it. Cleaning policies and procedures, infection prevention and control training, personnel concerns and needs. This next slide is actually just a little snippet of one of our facility assessment tools. So this is kind of how it starts out with facility information and the points of contact, but then further goes into detail for the items that I just described in the last slide. And lastly, after the facility assessment is complete at your visit, we would be reviewing with you any needs or recommendations for the facility. So this would be an open conversation where we would all basically determine what the needs of the facility are. And maybe there's no needs at the current time, but maybe it's something that you would be able to tell us that your PPE is sufficient. However, if you have an outbreak, this is where you would have a large need for PPE, whether it was one or two positive cases or an outbreak in the facility, PPE is gonna be an area where you need assistance or maybe cohorting or something of that nature. Um, so we'll decide together what those um, re recommended follow-up items are, and we'll be able to address them, whether it's through education, testing, PPE, or any of those items we talked about. We'll then assign the follow-up to the appropriate LECOM team. So if it is PPE, there might be a different group uh, to work with in order to get you what you need, but your on-site visitors will be your liaisons to those different branches of our team. And lastly, we would like to confirm a follow-up visit between September and November for our team to come back out and follow up on any items that we have determined need a little bit work um, on all of our parts to get the facility and the residents and staff um, safely through our COVID-19 journey. So overall, I just wanted to mention that the visits are non-punitive in nature. They're just purely so we have an understanding of your facility and we can easily help either your current needs or your future needs to the best of our ability with knowing all of the extra information. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Babiak. Um, next slide. That's it, okay, good. So with that, we're done with our sort of presentation uh, uh, section. So um, we can, if you have any questions, um, we can go to our chat box and we can kind of see if you have any questions. Uh, if if uh, you, after this presentation, if you have any questions, you can uh, go ahead and email um, us, the info at lecomrrhc.org, and uh, we'll be answering any questions that you may have. So, um, I guess we have a few minutes, and um, if you want to unmute and ask the questions, we can take some uh, take a few questions. Okay. Well, uh, if there are no questions. I uh, oh, here is a question. 
Will you provide the slides of information shared today? Yes, absolutely. We will uh, send that out uh, to everybody, and we'll, we can send out and post the uh, recording of today's webinar. Does DHAs recognize the webinars for appropriate required training hours for PC administrators? This is Nancy. Um, I can answer uh, well, that question. Yeah. If sure. you don't mind. So we are having No, go ahead. Uh, we are having conversations. I'll turn back on my video. Um, for the, uh, that is probably somebody who was a participant in the eSkip program because we were able to make sure that those webinars counted toward your training hours. So that's not the same as providing a certificate, but you could use those to count towards your training hours. Uh, we have asked the state to clarify, but we have every expectation that that will be true for personal care administrators going forward in this program, but you can't hold me to that yet, but you can trust that I am on the case and that is the goal that we have in mind for you. The state has been very supportive of all this education and training and uh, we do believe they're gonna allow these hours to count, but I will get you that confirmation. Okay, so um, there is a question coming in saying, if you have a physician for Allegheny County coming to a Green County, do you have any recommendation to ensure resident safety? Um, so let me, just so I understand the question, you're saying there is uh, attending physicians uh, driving from Allegheny County going into uh, Green County. Um, Susanna, uh, can I, uh, so, um, th this is, yeah. Um, yes, that's, that's accurate. Okay. So, um, yeah, we, we can discuss this sort of, uh, I can get back to offline and then whatever we, we, cause I need to understand the, the exact circumstances where this physician is coming from, what kind of facility is going and what other things that, you know, he or she is doing and stuff to answer that question. Uh, but, okay. um, Generally speaking, if, you know, just for everybody's uh, uh, sort of, uh, if you don't know, generally speaking, uh, the best way to do it is that if you don't know their status and they have to come in for whatever reason, number one, uh, uh, with this, if they're a physician, if you could do, if you're not sure where they're coming from, uh, you, telemedicine would be a strategy that I would highly recommend. And uh, you can use uh, any sort of video uh, chat uh, platforms to actually um, a facilitative visit if it need be, so they don't need to come into your facility. That's one strategy you have. Two is if they absolutely have to come in for whatever reason, my recommendation would be that give them the full PPE uh, to, before they come into your facility and they need to wear N95 mask. And uh, this way it protects them and, and your residents and your staff when they come in and stuff. So, and then we can, um, Suzanne, when we go out there, we can uh, answer that question or I'll call you and we can have a separate discussion about that. Okay. Hey, perfect. Um, Thank you very much. Sure. And then what type of criteria do you use to determine if you will help in staffing crisis at a community? Uh, Hi, this is Jamie Babiak. I can help answer that question. So a lot of the questions on the assessment form that focus on staffing will basically be uh, surrounding your internal policies. So obviously it asks what your normal PPD is versus what maybe your current PPD is. If you have staff off due to symptoms or travel or maybe contacts with a presumptively positive person. Um, but it also actually asks what your internal policies are. So what is your policy on allowing staff to return to work? And what is your policy on um, if staff work at more than one place, because I think all of us experience staff that work maybe per diem at our facility or full time at another facility, full time at a local hospital or something like that. So it actually takes all of those things into consideration to kind of determine where you are with it to say if you did have an outbreak in your facility, um, you, what would you do? Would you allow asymptomatic positive staff to work in a positive resident zone? So it's really going to be um, community specific and most of the most of what needs to be done will certainly rely on the facility as far as do you have an agency contract in place or something like that to first kind of branch out from your normal staffing or do you have alternate shifts or different um, maybe some nursing administration to help can you train um, 
we were just at one facility the other day who had a very excellent idea of training their department managers in the nurse aid waiver uh, program that's provided. So it's kind of just, you know, an overall understanding of what you've done so far, what you can do, and then basically how we can assist from within your, um, you know, your policies and procedures and see what we can come up with to uh, support that. Does that answer the question, hopefully? Okay, so uh, there's another question coming in saying, does this program replace the current ECRI consultation program? Will there be collaboration with Healthcare Coalition? Um, I, I think um, uh, it's a, uh, the answer is I'm unsure, and uh, they're, they're having discussions at the DHS and DOH and how they determine when they're going to have uh, 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 sort of um, dispatch the consultation uh, versus how we're going to be working with the healthcare coalition is not clear to me. So as soon as we get some clarification for that, I will certainly uh, get back to everybody about that. So um, there was a question regarding uh, resources and funding for testing. Um, so uh, in regards to uh, uh, Oh, Lisa had a question. Sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, Lisa. So, uh, is there funding available directly to facility for testing? Many are paying private labs for employee testing. How and where is funding available for testing? So, this is a, a really excellent uh, question uh, because uh, all of us experience the same thing. Um, so, we are trying to work with our uh, lab partners to obviously bill third uh, party for any testing for our residents and patients. Um, and as far as the employees, we're really working with um, our partner ACL to trying to have them uh, bill third party. But it looks like uh, they're they're not going to do that as of now. Um, so it it it, be, it falls upon us uh, to to do that. So one of the things is that all of you. Uh, have received uh, CARES Act money for this purpose for uh, the pandemic. Um, so I would say that, uh, you know, those are the resources that you should look into and allocate some uh, dollars to sort of uh, allocate to staff testing. Uh, in the event that um, you're out of those funds and it's not possible and we, 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 we you know, have, have uh, exhausted that resources and stuff, uh, certainly uh, the RACP, and the State uh, Bureau of Labs will, will step in and kind of help you uh, with the uh, testing. Um, so uh, I think to, to, I guess, reassure everybody, uh, one way or another, if you need testing and stuff, resources will be there uh, to test. And I think our number one priority is to make sure that your staff and residents are safe. And then um, uh, as far as the finances go, um, there, there will be enough resources that um, we can accomplish this. Okay, does anybody have any other questions? Okay. So, um, with that being said, we have a fire alarm in our facility, so we're going to end this webinar now, and then we're happy to answer any questions that you have uh, uh, with email. So thank you for your participation, and I hope to meet all of you. Uh,